speakers and our presentations. So we are using GoToWebinar today for our meeting. If you go over to the side panel, you'll see that there are some handouts, including the minutes from our last meeting. So you can get a copy of the, the March meeting minutes in the handout section. And there's also some flyers for upcoming resources in that section as well. If you have any questions uh, for the presenters, you can use the chat box to type in your question. And also if you have any feedback um, for us throughout the meeting, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, we would love to see your uh, comments or questions using the chat box. So I will turn it over to the Essex Metro Immunization Coalition Chair, Dr. Joseph Schwab from Rutgers New Jersey Medical School to do welcoming remarks and start the meeting. Okay, thanks Emily and uh, a warm welcome to everyone on the call. Uh, welcome back and uh, especially to our new members. Um, uh, I'd like to give you a special welcome to this meeting and I hope you find the uh, presentation helpful and the network opportunities um, useful to you. Uh, so for one, uh, to start with, uh, the minutes for the meeting, as Emily mentioned, are available in the handouts section. If you didn't have a chance to look at them, uh, you should have received a copy as well by email. You can look at it there. Um, the way we'll work approving the minutes today is that if you have any corrections or if you feel that uh, the minutes need to be revised, please put those comments in the chat. Um, if you don't approve the minutes, put that in the chat. Otherwise, we'll assume that the minutes are approved um, when we tally that at the end of the meeting. Uh, and then uh, also at the end of the meeting, there will be some opportunity for uh, questions after the presentation uh, and after the updates. And if anyone has any updates from our partner organizations, please feel free to put those in the chat as well. And uh, we'll try to read some of those off at the end of the meeting, uh, Dr. Esni Sharp will be handling that part of it. So I think um, we can move into the first presentation. Um, so I'm, uh, our topic for this morning is the hepatitis B birth dose. Um, and I'm gonna give a, a short background on hepatitis B uh, as well as the vaccine. And then we've got our present presenters from the partnership um, who are going to be talking about a quality improvement project that we've been doing um, with our partner hospitals to try to increase compliance with the hepatitis B birth dose. I apologize for not having a video on this call, but um, I think you're better off just hearing my voice anyway. So um, we can move on to the next slide. So I have no um, conflicts of interest to report related to this talk. So first, um, what is hep hepatitis B? Hepatitis B is a liver infection caused by the hepatitis B virus. Hep HPV is a small double-stranded DNA virus, um, and there are several serologic markers um, that can be tested for to test for infection as well as for immunity to the, to the infection um, after the body's mounted a response. And so the physicians can use a different combination of antigen and antibody tests to determine where a patient is in, term, in terms of acute, chronic, um, or convalescent phase of their infection. Next slide. Um, hepatitis B is divided into two kinds of infection. So um, most of the time, hepatitis B is an acute infection um, and the uh, symptoms present in the first six months after someone's been exposed to hepatitis B, B virus. Some of these patients have no symptoms at all or only mild illness. However, others have a more severe case of hepatitis that might require hospitalization. Um, some patients, especially those who get infected as adults are able to clear the virus without any treatment. However, for other people, acute hepatitis B will lead to a lifelong infection known as chronic hepatitis B. And chronic hepatitis B um, can lead to serious health problem, 
including uh, chronic liver damage, cirrhosis, liver cancer, and even death. Next slide. So the uh, amount of hepatitis B that we see um, really depends on where a patient is from. Um, and we know that the, the amount of hepatitis B disease varies um, in different parts of the world. And even within a, a country like the United States, it varies in different populations. Um, hepatitis B is more common in some countries in Asia, Africa, South America, and the Caribbean. And so here in the United States, we see more cases um, among immigrants from these areas. Many of them, because they were infected as children and didn't have or don't recall having disease, um, might not know it, especially since they themselves might have been infected as infants. Um, next slide. Um, as I mentioned, there are other risk factors or subpopulations that have increased disease. Among them are um, people that use in injected drugs. Um, and so as an example, between 2009 and 2013, um, we saw a rise in acute hepatitis B infection in three states, Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia, that directly correlated with an increased rate of injection drug use in that population. So rates kind of track uh, directly. Um, and so we know that depending on where, our pra where we practice and where our families come from and the characteristics of um, our families, we may see higher rates of disease in certain communities. Chronic hepatitis B is estimated to affect between 850,000 and 2.2 million people in the United States. And as I mentioned earlier, most of, most of those are immigrants from endemic countries. Next, we'll, I'll give you a little background on the clinical features of hepatitis B. So hepatitis B has an incubation period of 60 to 90 days. And so by the time a patient develops symptoms, uh, they may not really easily recall where they got uh, infected and when, because it can take two to three months. Um, clinical signs and symptoms are more common in adults. And so many people who are infected as children um, will have uh, no symptoms. And that's important because um, children are also more likely to go on to have chronic disease. Uh, the infection is characterized by a prodrome phase, which lasts about three to 10 days. Um, and it's pretty nonspecific. So it looks like most other viral infections where you have fever, malaise, anorexia, or loss of appetite. There can be nausea and some abdominal discomfort. Um, and then you may start to see the urine becoming a little darker. Um, after that, patients will enter what's called the icteric phase, where they have jaundice. And so their skin and um, the white parts of their eye, the sclera, look yellow. Uh, the stools become light or gray colored, and they may have some tenderness. And when a physician examines them, um, they can have an enlarged liver or hepatomegaly. Next slide. Um, after that, they'll enter a convalescent phase, which can last from weeks to months. Um, and that's characterized by persistent malaise and fatigue, um, which can last even while the jaundice, the anorexia, and the other symptoms disappear. Um, and then most adults will recover um, from this, uh, and they do not progress to um, chronic disease. Um, most, um, but in contrast, 90% of uh, hepatitis B infections in infants progress to chronic infection. Um, we know that vertical transmission uh, from mother to infant at birth is highly efficient. And prior to the uh, use of post-exposure prophylaxis, which I'll go into it uh, later on in the talk, the number of infants born to uh, mothers who had hepatitis B um, who became infected ranged anywhere from 30 to 85%. And the amount, the number of infections could be predicted um, by using, uh, looking at which of the antigens uh, the mother still had positive. And so and an infant can get hepatitis B from a mother, whether she has an acute infection or whether she has chronic disease. Um, most of it that we see nowadays is related to uh, chronic hepatitis B in women who are carriers with, with no symptoms themselves. Um, with the use of immunoglobulin, which I'll go into in a little while, 
Um, that rate of transmission, which was, as I said, from 30 to 80 percent, has been cut from to about 0.7 to around 1 percent of infants who develop infections. So um, transmission is by uh, through body fluids from persons who have either acute or chronic infection. Um, the highest concentrations of virus are found in blood and other serous fluids. However, it can also be found in saliva, tears, urine, and semen. Um, in the United States, um, the most common forms of transmission are uh, related to blood exposure through injection, drug use, perinatal transition, transmission from mother to child, and by sexual contact with infected persons um, and over time with repeated sexual encounters, um, even though semen is um, a have, has fewer um, virus particles in them, um, can result in transmission. Next slide. So as I mentioned, about 40% of infants who are born to HPV infected mother will develop chronic hepatitis B infection and about one-fourth of them will die from chronic liver disease. It's important to note that hepatitis B is not spread through food or water, through sharing utensils, through breastfeeding, hugging, kissing, hand-holding, coughing, or sneezing. So it really requires more intimate contact um, for it to occur. Next slide. Um, so hepatitis, persons with chronic infection are often asymptomatic and may not be aware that they are infected. However, as I mentioned, they are capable of infecting others and have been referred to in, as carriers of hepatitis B. Uh, chronic infection is responsible for most of the morbidity and mortality related to hepatitis B infection and includes chronic hepatitis, as well as liver cirrhosis, liver failure, and hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, so the proportion of patients who with acute HPV or hepatitis B virus infection that progresses to chronic disease um, varies with age. So only about 5% of adults will go on to become chronic carriers. However, 30 to 50% of young children and 90% of uh, infants who are infected will go on to become chronic carriers of hepatitis B. And so the combination of those infants being um, asymptomatic and becoming chronic carriers um, is really an important uh, reason why we need to be aggressive about um, preventing and then or detecting and treating um, that perinatal acquisition of hepatitis B. So the next slide. So as I said, about 25% of children who are infected um, during childhood will die prematurely from cirrhosis or liver cancer, um, as opposed to 15% of those who are infected uh, later on in life. Okay, so next slide. So on to the, uh, the topic of our talk, which is prevention strategies. Uh, the cornerstone of prevention really is vaccination. Um, and so we want universal vaccination of infants beginning at birth. Uh, we also uh, recommend routine vaccination of unvaccinated children who are less than 19 years of age, um, vaccination of adults who are at risk for HPV infection, including um, anyone who um, requests the vaccine even without acknowledgement of a specific risk factor. Um, in addition, uh, we can treat pregnant women who are screened for hepatitis B with antiviral therapy if their viral loads are high, and that can be measured. Um, and then uh, infants who are uh, born to women who are known to be antigen positive or carriers can, in addition to early vaccination, receive hepatitis B immune globulin, um, which will bind to and counteract uh, the virus that they've acquired and then as, as the vaccine um, helps them develop their own immunity. Um, so next um, we'll talk about some of the, vac the vaccines that are available. So the hepatitis B vaccine is a recombinant hepatitis B 
uh, which means that it's uh, because it's a DNA virus, what we can do is take the DNA uh, from the hepatitis B virus and insert it into uh, a yeast, and then the yeast will actually make the vaccine against the surface antigen so that the uh, body then has antibodies that recommend the surface of hepatitis B um, without a patient actually needing to be infected with hepatitis B virus. Uh, and it's uh, given by intramuscular injection. Next slide. Uh, since it's made in yeast, it does contain yeast protein. Uh, the vaccines also can contain aluminum adjuvant, which is most common that helps the body um, respond to the vaccine or a synthetic adjuvant. Um, some of the preparations do contain latex, so that's important if a patient has a latex allergy. And uh, some of the um, vaccines that have come are in combination with other vaccines that are used in pediatrics um, have um, antibi antibiotics in them to prevent um, contamination. So these are the, the products that are listed. Um, that we use. Uh, the first three are used in pediatrics, and the first two, Hep B and Gerix or Recombivax, are the ones that are used for the birth dose. So those two uh, on the first bullet, uh, the Hep B vaccines, are vaccines that protect only against hepatitis B. Um, for the remainder of the series, most people are using combination products, uh, which in, one of them is Pediarix, which includes the hepatitis B in conjunction with a DTaP and an IPV dose, and those can be used for the two, four, and six-month doses. Um, there's a new product called Vaxellus, which is a combination of DTaP, IPV, Hep B, and the Hib. So they get um, all of those antigens, all six of them, in a single injection. And I think um, we just heard in our product, in our clinic, that that's uh, available now for ordering from VFC. Um, the last two are used in adults. Heplizav B is um, a vaccine that protects only against hepatitis B. And then Twinrix um, is a combination of Hep A and Hep B. Next slide is the effectiveness. So hepatitis B, B uh, vaccine um, is a very effective vaccine. Over 90% of infants, children, and adolescents, and more than 90% of healthy adults younger than 40 years of age develop protective antibodies following a complete HB, uh, Hep B vaccine series. Um, there is an age-specific decline in immunogenicity so that by 60 years, only about 75% of people develop protective antibodies. Um, infants uh, born to women who are HBV hepatitis B surface antigen positive um, will receive, in addition to the vaccine, um, a dose of hepatitis B immunoglobulin, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it's also important to know that the hepatitis B vaccine results in real, a very good and strong lasting immunity. So even though you may not be able to measure antibodies in the blood, um, because those do decline over time. Immune mem memory remains intact for more than 30 years following immunization, and booster doses are not recommended. Um, so for certain patients, larger doses or increased number of doses may be necessary, particular, particularly for people who are um, immunized while they're on dialysis or if they're immuno, immunocompromised for another reason, for example, with HIV uh, infection. Next slide. So um, who should get the vaccine? First of all, uh, the, the uh, focus of the next part of our talk is looking at um, the first recommendation, which is all infants should be given the vaccine within 24 hours of birth. Um, Children and adolescents through 18 years of age who have not been previously vaccinated should all receive the vaccine. Um, adults at risk for HP, HBV infection uh, should be vaccinated. And those um, include um, sexual exposure, for example, people who have partners who are known to be uh, carriers of hepatitis B, um, household contacts of persons 
who are carriers of hepatitis B chronic infection, um, people who might be exposed by uh, through their uh, job where they might be exposed to blood products, for example, if they're working in uh, staff facilities for developmentally disabled persons, healthcare and public safety workers, um, people with end-stage renal disease um, who are on any kind of dialysis should get the vaccine, people with diabetes um, should get the vaccine, and people with um, hepatitis C infection should all, and chronic liver disease are also recommended to get the vaccine. These are all recommendations for adults. Um, and in, in uh, people traveling internationally who will be going to regions with high or intermediate levels of hepatitis B rates um, may also get the vaccine, as well as HIV infected people and um, incarcerated people. Um, pregnancy is not a contraindication to hepatitis B vaccine and uh, the available vaccines contain non-infectious hepatitis B surface antigen, and so they pose no risk to the developing fetus. And then the next slide. So some people um, may not be eligible for the vaccine. There are a few contraindications, but it's a, it is a very safe vaccine. Anyone who had a, a severe allergic reaction to any vaccine component, um, such as a hypersensitivity to yeast, or had a bad reaction to a, a, an initial dose of the vaccine or any prior dose um, would not be eligible for a subsequent dose. And a precaution means that um, we may want to postpone a dose in people who have an underlying um, or uh, transitory moderate or severe acute illness. Uh, on the next slide. Um, as I said, hepatitis B uh, vaccine is a safe vaccine and the side effects are minimal. 30 to about 30% of people may experience some pain from the vaccine. About one to 6% can have fever and about 3% can have redness, swelling, or headaches. So side effects are uh, minimal. Um, there were rare instances of associations with Guillain-Barre syndrome, with chronic fatigue syndrome, and some neurological disorders like uh, leukoencephalitis, optic neuritis, and transverse myelitis rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, and autoimmune disease. However, um, all of these things were found to be uh, associated, but there was no causal um, effect found, and um, no scientific panels have found an association between those and thing, or multiple sclerosis. Um, it's been stated that vaccination might uh, very rarely trigger alopecia, um, However, um, that was also found to be not statistically significant, and uh, so it hasn't been concluded. So the uh, next slide is the immunization schedule. Um, and so uh, we recommend that the first dose be given within the first 24 hours of birth. Um, that uh, cutoff is lower to 12 hours if the child is born to an hepatitis B surface antigen positive mother or a mother who carries hepatitis B. Um, it's also recommended that, that infants uh, who are born to hepatitis B surface antigen positive women finish the series by six months of age. Uh, the typical infant schedule is the first dose at zero or within the first 24 hours of birth, a second dose at one to two months of age, and then a third dose anywhere from six to 18 months of age. Um, and that third dose cannot be given earlier than 24 weeks of age or just a little shy of that six month mark. So if they do get an earlier dose um, before they reach 24 weeks of age, they would need a, 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 an extra dose um, at least eight weeks after that last dose when they've reached that minimum age of 24 weeks. And so that happens with kids who are receiving one of those combination products, for example, Pediorix, where it's given at um, two, four, and six months, the four month dose um, is their third dose, but it doesn't count as their last dose because it's a little too early um, and it's an extra dose, which is acceptable given the use of a combination product. Um, for premature infants who weigh less than 2000 grams, um, the first dose also is given, um, but shouldn't be counted in the series. And so they should receive a second dose at one month of an age and then finish off with two more doses um, by 24 weeks of age. 
and uh, that's calculated on chronologic age. So no matter how premature the baby is, um, if they're less than 2,000 grams, once they reach one month chronologic age, um, that's when they're given a, another dose, and that's considered their first official dose for the three dose series. Okay. One more slide. Um, so follow up testing, as I mentioned earlier, is generally not required. Um, it's universally required for infants who are born to um, mothers who are carriers of hepatitis B um, or born to uh, women whose status is not known. And those patients should be tested for both hepatitis B antigen as well as hepatitis B antibodies one to two months after they finish the hepatitis B vaccine series, which should uh, be somewhere between nine and 12 months of age. Um, given that they should finish the series by about six months. Um, although it's not routinely recommended, um, serologic testing is usually done for um, healthcare workers, public safety workers, patients who are receiving hemodialysis for HIV infected and other immunocompromised persons, and also for sexual partners of um, hepatitis B surface antigen positive carriers of hepatitis B. Um, but otherwise, a complete vaccine series is um, adequate to assume that patients are immune. Um, so the next slide um, just gives a few references. The top three are from the CDC, which I highly recommend that has all the information. Actually, most of what I took was after review of the CDC website, um, and that's a good source for all things vaccine. If you just go to cdc.gov slash vaccines, um, and then you can go to each of those um, topics. There's also a um, hepatitis B organization that had some good information. That's the fourth reference there. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'm going to ask you to put any questions you have in the chat, and we can um, hold those for the end after the remainder of the presentation. So next, I'd like to introduce to you um, Mackenzie Carey and Prachi Patel, who, be, who will be um, speaking um, to you about a quality improvement project to um, increase compliance with the hepatitis B birth dose in our um, pra um, participating hospitals. Uh, first, um, Mackenzie Carey is the quality improvement and planning manager at the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey. The QI staff provides support to the QI committee, including data preparation, VIP data analysis, and creating regional-wide annual data reports. They also develop needs assessments and support grant writing for the partnership. Outside of the partnership, Mackenzie volunteers at the Glen Ridge Volunteer Ambulance Squad, where she has been an EMT for over 10 years, and she works on quality assurance and improvement projects. Prachi Patel is the Quality Improvement Coordinator with the Partnerships QI team, working on various quality improvement initiatives, supporting our member hospitals. Prior to the quali her Quality Improvement Coordinator role, Prachi had years of experience with program planning, implementation, and data management with a focus on maternal and child health. And so I welcome them both, and I'm excited to hear their presentation on the hepatitis B birth dose. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Schraub, for that uh, introduction. Uh, today, Mackenzie and I will be presenting on hepatitis B birth dosage administration in northern New Jersey. Just, um, just a little background about our partnership service region. Uh, we house 25 birth facilities, which includes 23 member hospitals and two birthing centers. Um, we are a private nonprofit central organization that's licensed by New Jersey Department of Health. And the counties that we serve in our region are Bergen, Essex, Hudson, Morris, Passaic, Sussex, Union, and Warren. Um, the partnership has uh, serves these eight areas that vary in geographic size, population density, and community composition. It's to be noted that the region has four of the largest cities in New Jersey among some of the most densely populated locations in the country. The purpose um, for this uh, HEPB data poll, we use the VIP platform 
Um, and that's a web-based system for birth registration, um, prenatal and postpartum data. It has over 650 fields uh, varying from health, demographic information about the mother, father, and the baby. Uh, it's administered by New Jersey Dep Department of Health Office of Vital Statistics, OVSR. And we also have New Jersey specific data fields and um, data fields defined by NCHS. For our data analysis, we used some fields including mother's race and ethnicity, education, insurance, that insurance type, county residents, which will be um, displayed later in the presentation. A little bit about the northern population. The partnership currently has almost half of New Jersey's total population, 47.3, with Warren County being our smallest area, while Bergen is the largest. Within that population, um, looking, at, looking at it by um, sex, women make up 51.3, and of that percentage, we have about 38.5% of women of reproductive age. We also have about 50% of the births in New Jersey, uh, counting for almost 47,000 births. Uh, when we look at it by our service region, the counties with the highest percentages of births are Essex, Bergen, and Hudson, and the counties with the lowest percentage are Warren and Sussex. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the Hep B dose compliance. That's what Dr. Schwab was talking about earlier. With VIP, we are able to see when the, an infant gets their first dose. So we're seeing if that infant is compliant with the CDC guidelines on hep B birth dose vaccinations. There's gonna be a lot of data and I'm gonna try to make it as seamless as possible. I know sometimes we can get into the data overload, but I'm just gonna be pointing out the key highlights from each uh, graph and section. So right here, we have um, the information about the vaccine that Dr. Schwab was talking about. So this is, um, we're talking about the CDC guidelines, which Dr. Schwab mentioned that they are recommended to have the, all infants after, before 24 hours after birth. And if they are delivered by a mom who is suspected of having a hep B infection, that they get that prior to 12 hours after birth. So right here, we have all of Essex County and their facilities. So there are five birthing facilities in Essex County. We're showing you here the compliance rate. And so there's three segments. So there's compliant, late, and not compliant. So compliant babies are the ones that get their hep B birth vaccination at the proper time, right, with the CDC guidelines. The ones in that pink category are late. So those are the ones that still get it before discharge, but they do not get it within either that 12 to 24 hour window. And then the not compliant, those are the moms who decide not to give their child the hep C vaccination. Here we've separated it by the Essex County facilities. It has to be blinded because this is confidential data based on every facility. We can't go around saying which facility has which dose rate compliance that's not per our company pro protocol. So the main takeaway is that, you know, we just saw the compliance rate for all of Essex County and we have facilities here. This is facility E. They're doing a really good job. Their moms are almost 85% compliant and they only, they have less than 3% of the moms are not giving their, their infant the hep B vaccine. This is really good, right? This is what we want to see. We want all the facilities to look like this. Um, facility D could use a little bit of help, right? They have less than 70% 70, 70 compliance. Their late is about 20%. So overall, they're close to that 90% getting the vaccine, just not on that schedule that the CDC recommends. But they still have a high not compliance rate at about 10%. Another one to point out is, is facility B is doing a good job of getting it in, that, in time, right? They have a really low late sector section, right? Only 4% of babies are, are getting it and getting it late. That's excellent. They're following the, the CDC guidelines. 
but almost 20% of moms aren't giving their, their baby that vaccination. And we need to fix that, right? We want babies to be vaccinated for hep C. After all this stuff Dr. Schwab talks about, it's really important for the babies to be vaccinated. Here we're talking about Essex County facilities over time. So we started tracking this in 2016. And if I were to show you 2016 and 2017, you'd see, oh, there's a really big change, like more facilities are becoming compliant. And that's great. But if you look at these three years, 2018 to 2020, you can see that there isn't much change at all. We're staying around that 73 to 76% compliance, and the not compliant is staying the same, right around that 7, 8%. And obviously, we want to get that not compliant down, we, and we want the compliance rate up. Obviously, we want it to be 100%. It can never be 100%, right, because some people aren't going to want to get their children vaccinated for whatever reason. So this can never be 100%, but that's our goal. So even though over the past five years, we've made a lot of good progress, over the past three years, there hasn't been any real change. So that's something that we want to point out as an area for improvement in the county. Now we're showing you some happy dose compliance by maternal demographics. We're going to start with race. So this image, the main takeaway is that for black non-Hispanic moms, they have the lowest compliance rate of less than 70%. We want that number to get to get much higher. And they also have the highest not compliance rate. We want that to change as well. We want them to be closer to the Asian non-Hispanic rate who have the lowest not compliance rate out of any race in this in in moms who deliver at Essex County facilities. This graph is showing us by mom's uh, insurance status. So mom can either have private insurance, she can be on Medicaid, there's a self-pay charity care and others. So the best category would be that self-pay charity care. They have the lowest not compliance rate. Um, but there isn't really huge changes between the private Medicaid and self-pay insurance categories. Um, you might notice that the other one has, you know, a very high not compliant rate and a low compliant rate. And, you know, there aren't that many women who fall into this other category. So that data can sometimes be skewed. So we tend not to have to look at it with a huge emphasis on that section. Now we're looking at the Essex County facilities compliance by mom's education. So we have this broken up from everything from high school or less to a doctorate or professional degree. Overall, there doesn't really seem to be a major association between um, hefty vaccination compliance and mom's education. It's not like moms who ha don't have a high school degree are less compliant and moms with a college degree are. There just doesn't really seem to be a major association. Now we're looking at hep C dose compliance by maternal age. So overall, it doesn't really seem like there is that much of an association. There's a small, you see like a small increase and then decrease as we go from under 20 to 40 to 49. But overall, not a huge change for moms under 50. When we look at moms from 50 to 59, you can see, oh, wow, that doesn't look that great, right? A high not compliant rate and compliant and late are exactly the same. But just like with that other category when we were looking at insurance status, there's not that many moms who are between the ages of 50 and 59 delivering in just Essex County in 2020. So there aren't that many moms who make up that category, so it's skewed a little bit, and we don't want to emphasize too closely on that. Now we're looking at the Essex County Metro 5. So these are the five main um, cities of interest in Essex County. So those are East Newark, East Orange, Irvington, Newark, and Orange. Um, as you can see, East Newark has the highest compliance rate. That's really good. And they also have the lowest not compliance rate. So overall, that's really good. And then with the other cities, there isn't really a huge difference either between these, ma these major uh, metro areas in Essex County. So 
Part of our quality improvement team at the partnership, we have a committee from our board of trustees, and hepatitis B dose compliance has been a really strong interest for this for this committee. We had one of our um, uh, physicians mention that they heard that maybe moms are coming from other states delivering in New Jersey because our procedures or laws about uh, Hep B vaccinations were less stringent than, let's say, New York and Pennsylvania. So we're like, okay, cool. Let's see if there actually is any type of association. This graph actually came out of that. We saw that moms who reside in New York and Pennsylvania have a much lower compliance rate than New Jersey moms. So moms who who deliver in our partnership region who are from New Jersey have a 75% compliance rate and a less than 10% not compliance rate. Pretty good when, we, when we've looked at some of the other demographics and categories before. Here's the thing, moms from New York and Pennsylvania have a much less, lower compliance rate. Moms from New, Jer from New York have a less than 60% Hep B dose compliance rate and almost 35% of those moms are not vaccinating their children within those CDC guidelines. We don't have any data on what happens afterwards with their, their own private provider and pediatrician, but they are not following those CDC guidelines for that first dose. And the same with Pennsylvania. 66% of moms are compliant, but that's about 10% lower than New Jersey moms. And 20% are not compliant. So again, these are staggering numbers and this, um, physicians and the healthcare professionals in the northern New Jersey area should be aware that there might be moms coming from other areas who who might be hesitant and need, a, uh, need to be talked in a different way about hep B dose and other vaccines. Some of the barriers to quality improvement and the data that was just presented by Mackenzie are different policy and protocols at our member hospitals, incomplete accurate data entry, and uh, most importantly, hospital staff and turnover. So the accuracy of the data is dependent on the completeness and re reliability of the information entered by each birthing facility. Sometimes errors do occur when entering data, um, and there could be an error in value and with the high uh, staff turnover, just kind of, you know, making sure that all of the clerks and everyone knows that exactly how the data is being entered. And that is something that we do run in from time to time when we're looking at data. So that's just something to keep in mind when um, analyzing the data and um, looking at how our region is doing with Hep B dose compliance. So now we kind of just want to wrap up everything you presented today, kind of tied up with some recommendations and next steps. So we hope to work with healthcare professionals to emphasize the importance of that accurate data, right? Because if it's not entered into VIP correctly, we can't do proper um, public health sur surveillance. We also want to increase their confidence in making vaccine recommendations. We also want to work with patients in the Northern New Jersey region to decrease vaccine hesitancy. We learned from Dr. Schwab the importance of getting that hefty dose and in on our schedule. And so we want to decrease their hesitancy to getting that vaccine. We also want to work with our member hospitals to ensure policies match the CDC guidelines. We want to lower that late category, right? So if we can get that late category to drop and the compliance rate up, that's going to look awesome and it's going to be better for our for their patients and the members of our community. We also want to create awareness among the member hospitals regarding the HEPI dose compliance and to show them the data that we've, we've worked on and show them that there are demographics maybe and other factors that could influence um, a woman's decision on whether or not a vaccine is right for her and her family. So I guess now I think Emily's going to, if, if she's going to turn it over to her for questions if you guys have any. Hi, thank you so much, Mackenzie and Prachi and Dr. Schwab. These were really informative presentations and uh, really just covered a lot of uh, data. Oh, Mackenzie and Prachi in your presentation and Dr. Schwab, I think your uh, background on hepatitis B 
disease and uh, vaccination really was very comprehensive. So thank you um, to all of the presenters. We do have some questions from the audience. And if you uh, have not submitted a question yet, you can either type it into the chat box or put it in the questions box and we'll be sure to uh, let the presenters know. Um, so before we get to questions, I do just want to kind of come full circle into next steps and um, let you know that the partnership is going to be offering a, an educational webinar on August 11th for National Immunization Awareness Month in August. Um, it will be at 2 p.m. And Dr. Schwab, uh, it will be presenting as well as Vivian Baez from the University Hospital OBGYN uh, Women's Health Clinic. They are the presenters. It will be a one hour presentation and it will be offering nursing credits. So there is a flyer about that program in the handout section of um, today's webinar. And we also have the information posted on the partnership website on pmch.org under professional education and um, registration is open. So you can, can go ahead and register, save the date, August 11th at 2 p.m. And that webinar will really be um, focused on protecting babies at birth. So what do we want, to, what, what is the messaging that we need to give to expecting families around hepatitis B birth dose? And how do you have that conversation? Uh, whether you're working with pregnant women um, in a clinic setting or in home visiting setting, you know, what, what does that conversation look like? And then also immediately in the postpartum and, and in the inpatient setting in the hospital, what, how do you approach a mom that might be hesitant or declines the vaccination? Is there um, things that you can say to help um, move them towards wanting to be compliant and administer the dose? So, um, Let's get started with questions. So uh, the first question I'll, I'll actually, Dr. Schwab is asking a question. So um, is, he asks, is there a role for advocacy for laws similar to New York and Pennsylvania for New Jersey? Are their rates of compliance better? So is, um, you know, I guess that's a question, Mackenzie or Prachi, um, are you aware of, you know, if their laws are more stringent around hepatitis B birth dose administration, do their rates look better in those states? Is that information that you have available? So unfortunately, we don't have access to that. That This is just the birth record uh, information from New Jersey. I'm not sure if New York and Pennsylvania published that data. And if they do, it would be on a much lower time frame than we have access to the data currently. Okay. Um, there's another question for Mackenzie. So I'll, I'll stick, stay on you, Mackenzie. Are you aware of any QI projects that the facilities have worked on over the past few years? So you showed some data over the last three years. Is there anything that those facilities have worked on that you're aware of? Um, not that I'm aware of that we've worked with individually with individual hospitals on, but as a QI team, that's something, you know, that we discuss in our quarterly meetings. And this idea of this webinar, actually, that the idea was sparked in one of our QI meetings based on the data that we had been presenting. And um, just to kind of add to that, sometimes we will, have, we will have member hospitals reach out to us, um, not a project, but they will look at their compliance, what they do internally, and what we can do with our data. And they like to see exactly where they are, where they can make improvements, and um, just to kind of share with their staff. So there, we have done things like that in the past, but just nothing region-wide with every single hospital. It's when someone reaches out to us. Okay, great. So if there's anyone representing one of the um, a birthing facility on the call today or that watches the recording, they can reach out um, to the partnership and QI team and discuss some QI strategies, right? Um, and how to of develop course. a QI project. Okay. Um, yes. There's a project for, or there's a question for Dr. Schwab. So um, for children who are born to hepatitis B surface antigen positive women, and um, they go on to develop uh, chronic 
disease or liver disease, what does that prognosis look like? How likely are they to need a liver transplant for, for example? So unfortunately, yeah, the, the younger patients are infected, so infants, um, the higher the rates of progression to fulminant disease. And I think uh, one of the slide that I showed that 25% of the kids who are infected in the neonatal period will go on to die of liver failure uh, from that infection. And that's compared with uh, much lower rates for people who are infected as adults. First of all, progressing to chronic disease and then from uh, succumbing to that infection. And as a follow-up, is is our liver transplant, um, do they cure uh, chronic liver uh, disease from that's caused by um, neonatal hepatitis B infection? So I'm not an expert in liver transplant. I um, and I think there's still a risk of infection in the transplanted liver, so they would need antiviral therapy and immunosuppression, um, but they certainly would cure the liver failure. Okay. And another question for Dr. Schwab, uh, what is the risk in waiting for a pediatric appointment? Why is it so important that a baby receive the birth dose in the hospital within 24 hours? So, um, you know, ideally, we're testing all mothers. We know who, without a doubt, is hepatitis B infected carrier, um, and we would be able to target those babies for early vaccine and immunoglobulin. Um, but we don't know everyone. Many women um, deliver with an unknown status, um, and the tests are not 100%. So the way to cut down on hepatitis B transmission is to vaccinate all babies within that first 24 hours to get the most protection for uh, the population going forward. Thank you. All right, I think that's the questions that we had submitted during the presentation. Um, if you think of any others, you can certainly submit them in the questions box um, or the chat box. And I do just want to give an update. Thank you to Leslie Bivens from Somerset um, Health Department for approving the minutes uh, while during the presentation. So thank you, Leslie. Uh, thank you so much, Mackenzie and Prachi. We really appreciate you joining us today and sharing all this great information. And I think it will really inform, um, you know, our future um, hepatitis B quality improvement initiatives. We actually, we just got another question in before you go. So let me read it in case it's for you. Um, can hepatitis B be transmitted from mom to baby during her pro prodromal period? That's from Kim Daly. Yes, yes, it can. Anytime during that acute infection, um, it can be transmitted. Okay, thank you, Dr. Schwab. All right, thank you so much, Prachi and Mackenzie. We'll move on to um, the next part of our meeting. And thank you, um, doc Dr. Schwab, so much for this presentation. It was really wonderful and uh, great, great information. Okay, so. So uh, I will be um, giving a brief update on the working groups for, whoops. The working groups for uh, the SS Metro Immunization Coalition. For those of you that aren't aware, we do have two uh, working groups that meet between our quarterly meetings, and you are welcome to join either group. Uh, Kendra Julian is the Adolescent Immunization Specialist at the partnership, and she oversees the Community Education Working Group. Uh, she was not able to join us today, so but she did provide us some updates about what the group's been working on. Um, this past quarter. And, and you, as you can see, they have pro provided a lot of education and outreach around adolescent vaccines and HPV this past quarter. They distributed educational resource bags to uh, Drew University that could be shared with students. Um, 
about 100 educational materials were distributed to Community Health Strategist Health Clinic in Newark. And 55 Jersey City Charter School students watched the video, what every middle and high school student should know about HPV. So that is something that uh, Kendra has been working on with uh, schools, middle and high schools in the area to incorporate uh, informational videos that uh, she developed to into health classes um, for the students. So especially with remote learning, um, some of the schools have really embraced the idea of having guest speakers, as um, it, especially when it pertains to health topics. So um, Kendra has been able to work with some of the schools to show the video and then provide some education around the topic. And this working group is also discussing planning a flu health fair for the fall. So the group has suggested offering COVID-19 vaccine among other services being offered. They're still working on planning that. So if you're interested in joining um, this educational working group, you can contact uh, myself or Kendra Julian at the partnership and we would be happy to include you in the upcoming meeting. We also have the Community Engagement Working Group, which meets once um, in between our quarterly meetings. And um, we focus on increasing coalition membership. So for the pharmacy, we're looking at, you know, potentially outreaching to pharmacies because we see that with COVID-19 administration, they have really become um, essential partners in, in vaccinating, and they always were with adult vaccinations, but we really see a stronger, um, you know, connection with them. And also the fact that they are now um, using the New Jersey Immunization Information System, NJIIS, to um, track uh, edu um, immunizations. It means that we could use them as a partner and, and really collaborate on identifying patients that are uh, behind on immunizations or um, could use, could kind of be a, used as like a walk-in area um, for get, getting up to date on immunization. So we do want to try to get some outreach for pharmacy contacts and also faith-based organizations. For those of you that have been following the First Lady's office, First Lady um, Tammy Murphy has been working in the state to, with faith-based organizations to host Grateful for the Shot events um, to provide COVID-19 vaccines at um, faith-based organization sites. So um, again, we want to use that um, motiva um, momentum that we have with those organizations and partner potentially on other vaccine initiatives. And we're doing great with our newsletter subscribers. We have over 400 newsletter subscribers. We have 100 active members and we are increasing our social media following. We have Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. However, if um, you know someone that might be interested in joining the coalition, please send them our way. We're happy to add them onto our uh, newsletter list so that they receive our monthly newsletter and everyone is welcome to join our quarterly meetings as well. Okay, um, next we want to congratulate Dr. Schwab. So the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey is pleased to announce that Dr. Schwab was appointed as the new board chair. So in addition to his role as the chair for the board of trustees, uh, Dr. Schwab will continue to lead the partnerships Essex Metro Immunization Coalition. So we're happy that he's um, staying on with us and we also want to congratulate him on his new role. So congratulations, Dr. Schwab. And uh, for those of you that have been following the Protect Me With 3 Plus contest, the winners were announced. So if you go on protectmewith3.com, you can view the winners. This is an example of the first place poster for um, high school students. So first place went to Seneca Godbull um, from John P. Stevens High School. And you can see her poster on meningococcal disease um, 
won first place. So it was very creative. And all of the winners uh, attended an award ceremony uh, virtually in May. And uh, we actually um, are able to use their posters and videos as education pieces to share with other students. And uh, for next year's Protect Me With 3 Plus contest, we will be hosting that again um, starting in the fall. So students can get can start submitting next year as well. And this is a great project um, for students to get involved with that want to learn more about vaccines. The partnership is also grateful and honored for being recognized by the New Jersey Department of Health as a recipient of the 2020-2021 New Jersey Influenza Honor Roll. And we also received top honors for um, our Power to Protect Against Flu campaign. So thank you to all of the Essex Metro Immunization Coalition members who had a role in that um, campaign as well. You uh, were really wonderful in getting the word out and sharing the information on your channels, your social media channels, and with your network. So thank you so much for um, helping us to work with that campaign. And if you have, uh, you know, ideas um, or you'd like to get more ideas about how to promote flu, uh, especially this upcoming flu season, you can check out the website listed here on nj.gov. Um, all of the awardee information is listed there and some campaign ideas from um, previous winners are also listed there. So here's some upcoming events. Um, again, you can keep your eye open for Grateful for the Shot COVID-19 events um, happening throughout the state in June, um, mostly with faith-based organizations. And that is, uh, those are being organized through the First Lady's um, office. And on June 22nd at 2 p.m., we will be offering a webinar on COVID-19 vaccine confidence for adolescents. So many of you may have attended the January um, session that we offered for COVID-19 vaccine confidence for adults. But now that uh, COVID-19 vaccination is available for 12, for those 12 and up, uh, we wanted to specifically address any hesitation that parents might have around um, vaccinating their children. And so this, um, this uh, presentation will cover that topic. And Elizabeth Soborn, the vaccines medical director at Pfizer is going to be presenting that information. Um, this, this particular uh, presentation is open for healthcare professionals and um, public health professionals working with families um, or the community. So it's not open to the public, um, but the registration did go out um, this week, and, and we also will include it in a, the next um, EMIC newsletter as well. Okay. August is National Immunization Awareness Month. So if you are planning any events around Essex County, please let us know and share that with us. And um, we're happy to help promote your events. I know the Newark Department of Health usually um, hosts their school bus express program in uh, starting in August, which allows for increased access to vaccine visits um, in, you know, usually Saturdays in August and also um, some extended hours during the week. So we will share, we're happy to share information with our partners um, about upcoming events. And as I mentioned today, there's a handout um, in the handout section uh, about the webinar happening on August 11th at 2 p.m., which is titled Protecting Babies at Birth, Recommending Hepatitis B Vaccine to Parents. And also save the date for our upcoming EMIC meetings. They will be September 15th and December 15th, and we will share more information about those um, shortly. Lastly, I just want to remind everyone that um, may be working with expecting families that we have the Two Protects Two campaign materials available on our website, pmch.org, um, to order. They're free. We can uh, distribute them in English and Spanish, and we are happy to mail them out to you. So you just go onto our website. Here's a screenshot of where you go to. 
um, you click on the Two Protects Two campaign and you can order here. It will take you to a Microsoft Forms um, screen and you can choose which items that you would like and we will send those uh, materials out to you. So these were developed using feedback from focus groups with moms. We um, had them medically reviewed by physicians and you can order hard copy materials or we also have digital copies available for download on our website as well. So these are just um, reminders of what those materials look like. And we also have bookmarks. Okay, so now I'm turning it over to uh, Dr. Esni Sharp, EMIC Vice Chair and CEO of Bessie May Women and Family Health Center in East Orange to get some um, partner updates from EMIC members and um, get some feedback on how the coalition is doing to serve your needs of promoting immunizations in the Essex County area. Thank you, Emily, and good afternoon to all of our partners and anyone that is a uh, new person that uh, have been uh, sitting through our meeting today. I want to just thank Dr. Schwab for such an outstanding presentation, as well as congratulate him again on his new appointment as um, board chair for the, the partnership um, executive committee. And also, I want to thank um, Patchy and McKenzie for such a great presentation, very informational, educational. We appreciate all that you shared with us today. Thank you, Emily, for keeping us updated on everything. And so um, today, I just want to um, ask if any of our existing partners, um, members have any feedback that they would like to share about our meetings, any ideas for new members to invite to the coalition, and asking people to share what they are seeing or hearing in the community about routine immunizations or even COVID-19 vaccinations. If um, that could be addressed, if you could um, put those comments or those shared uh, information in the chat. It will be greatly appreciated and we're monitoring the chat and, you know, it'll be good for us to get that information and respond appropriately. Does any of our partners at this time have any updates regarding or feedback regarding um, our meetings or even if you have any other information that you want to share at this time, please Put it in the chat, or you can ask a question. And um, while we're waiting, if anyone is posting any information or questions, um, we also will be sharing a survey to all of our members this summer via a Microsoft form survey to get feedback and suggestions. And again, we just thank everyone for um, being a diligent and continued partner of EMIC and uh, please continue to share throughout the community um, for us to recruit and get uh, new partners. Um, we need as many as we can get. Um, we're all on the same team and we're all uh, working hard and diligently in the community. And so we appreciate you and all your hard work and what you do as well. Are there any um, updates in the chat, Emily? We do have one as me, um, Leanne Lowenthal from uh, NJIIS mentioned that for sites interested in administering the COVID vaccine, COVID vaccine enrollment is now open on njiis.nj.gov. And I will share that um, information in the chat box for the all of the audience so that you have access to that as well. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Any more? That's all that's come in so far. I know it takes a little bit for people to um, 
to type in, but I just shared that in the chat as well. So for sites interested in administering COVID vaccine, COVID vaccine enrollment is open on njiis.nj.gov. And I will add actually as a as an announcement be, just because we've been close to it, um, you know, we do receive a lot of calls about um, people who have misplaced their vaccine card. Um, you know, if they've received COVID vaccine and they misplaced their card um, and they can actually go to njiis.nj.gov, that website that we just shared in the um, chat and there's, uh, they can submit a request to have their card replaced. So that's actually you know, pretty helpful information because we're getting a lot of calls about people who lost their card and they're worried about you know, if they need to use it to show for employment or if they'll need to show proof of, of vaccination. So if you, you know, hear of people that are losing their card, there is something they can do to get it um, replaced. And they would go to this website submit a request and they would put in the information of, that's needed and um, they will be able to get a new card. Great, thank you so much, Emily. And also and, congratulations, Emily, for your newest addition to your family on the behalf of Nick. Thank you, Esme, I appreciate that. I'm glad to be back. Welcome back, welcome back, we're glad you um, are healthy and safe and back with us. If Thank there's you. no more, um, Emily, do you think we should wait any longer? Because if not, I will just proceed to close out if Dr. Schwab doesn't have anything else that he would like to add to today's meeting. No, thanks, Esme, go ahead. Okay, is that it, Emily? Yeah, I think we can close out. And if anybody has an announcement to share after the meeting ends, you feel free to contact me directly and I'll make sure that it gets out to the coalition. Wonderful, thank you so much. And again, thank you to all of our partners and, and also we commend you for the great work you're doing in the community to help uh, people with their health and wellness and to be safe. And if that's it, we will see everyone